Hey, welcome everybody. We're glad that you're here. I hope that you like that slideshow. That music now will be in my mind, let's see, for the rest of my life. Um, so if you like the music, we'll keep playing it. Um, hey, if you would like to have a picture of you or your family or somebody else that you don't know, you can send us a picture. We're actually going to make more of those slideshows to include in our services online. We'd love to see pictures of you and how you're making it through these days of stay at home and stay healthy. So send us a picture. There's a, an email and a, a text number that you can text us pictures if you'd like to uh, be included in slideshows in the future. We're so glad that you joined us today. And we're going to take time this morning to have some time for prayer, time for singing songs to the Master, the, our Lord Jesus, and also time to look into the Word and be strengthened by the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together before we take these uh, moments to sing songs. God, we thank you for these moments that we have together. We thank you that you will join us and give us strength to carry on. I pray, Lord, that you would give strength to each person that's gathered for this service. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for what you did for us on our behalf to make a way to having peace with you, God. We love you. We sing these songs as honor to you. And we pray to you, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, in the great name of our Master, the Lord Jesus. The Lord bless you. God bless you as you worship. And 
so glad that you're with us today. I've really been looking forward to taking time to take our next step in our our online gatherings and our next step into the Word. We start today a series in the book of Acts. Now, the past five or six weeks, really, we've gone week by week 
just responding, as it were, to what's been happening through this time of coronavirus and the shutdown, not just of our country, but the shutdown of the world. And as I looked ahead, I thought, you know, we need to have some kind of semblance of a path and a plan. And I I had planned for our fellowship that we would study together on Sunday mornings, the book of Acts. And I thought, you know what? That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to stay the course in our time in the scriptures. And that's really where the strength of the church is, through the Holy Spirit, God opening our minds to the scriptures. In fact, in just a moment, I'll read a scripture that talks about how Jesus opened up the minds of his disciples to understand the scriptures. So before we take another step forward, maybe we could just take a moment to pray and invite the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Because when the church gathers, it's the Holy Spirit that illuminates, that gives understanding or discernment of anything spiritual. A human being might be the one who is doing the teaching, as it were, the speaking, but it's the Holy Spirit that brings to you and to me an understanding, a discernment of spiritual things. So let's not proceed without him. In fact, let's intentionally put ourselves under his counsel and teaching. Pray with me, would you please? We do that just now, just by an act and intention of our will. We sit at your feet, Holy Spirit, inviting you to be our teacher, committing to you. We will receive what you have for us. I ask on our behalf, oh God, would you speak to us through the Holy Spirit in a way that we might be able to understand you? And would you give us courage to follow what you've put before us? We thank you that we don't have to simply depend on our own intellect to understand spiritual things, but that you will help us. And we give you honor, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as the one true God. Amen. All right, with that, let's jump into the scriptures. Now, last week we celebrated Easter, we celebrated the Lord's resurrection. So we're going to pick up the story of the Acts of the Apostles just before we enter into the book of Acts. We'll be looking at the Lord's ascension. It's interesting, this, this, uh, this message, and the time of teaching, I was greatly benefited by the help and the teaching of Dr. Timothy Keller. He is a pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian in New York. His materials are free online. You can access a brilliant teacher. He's a great reference point for me. And I just want to acknowledge that he really helped me understand the scriptures that we'll go through today. I liked what he said. There's, there's holidays for the birth of Jesus. That's Christmas. And for his death, the Good Friday, we take time to remember his death and his resurrection, Easter. There's all holidays for all of those events. You can go to any card store, Hallmark, and get a card for any one of those events. But there's no holiday and there's no cards for his ascension. Go ahead, try to find a happy ascension card from Jesus <laughs> or about his ascension. They, they don't exist. But it's so important, that moment and time in the life of Christ, his ascension. And so that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to look first at Luke's description of that in his gospel, and then pick it up again as Luke describes it again in the book of Acts, because Dr. Luke was the author of both the gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. So we'll go to Luke chapter 24 and pick it up at verse 45. This is what Luke says right at the very end, the close of his gospel of the life of Christ. Luke says this, and he's commenting about Jesus. He says, then he, Jesus, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. 
There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. And Jesus goes on to say to his disciples, you are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Then Jesus led them to Bethany and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. So they worshiped him and they returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy and they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. This is interesting because in Luke's account of the ascension, there's a portion that is not mentioned um, in his gospel that he mentions and picks up in the book of Acts. And so I want to just continue with this. Keep your mind in this gathering. Jesus has gathered his disciples, and he is ascending to heaven. And before he does, he gives them one last blessing and one last charge. So Luke, who wrote the gospel for a man named Theophilus, has written a second account or the continuing acts of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The book is called The Acts of the Apostles, but it really could probably more accurately be called The Acts of Jesus Christ or The Ongoing Actions of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So in the book of Acts, chapter 1, Luke starts it this way, uh, writing to Theophilus. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. He says, in my first book, the Gospel of Luke, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. He, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I have told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this is this next verse is what was missing out of Luke's account to Theophilus in his gospel. It says in Acts 1, 6, So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of a half a mile. So I want to unpack this and look at the ascension of Jesus. Specifically, I want to look at what is implied here in the scriptures about the power of the ascension, the meaning of the ascension, and also what what are the implications for you and I as followers of the Lord Jesus. And by the way, you may be watching this and be at a place in your own life, your own faith journey, where you're investigating the claims of Jesus. Who is this Jesus Christ? What is Christianity? If that's you, I'm so glad that you've joined us. 
boy, you are welcome in our times of gathering and looking into the scriptures. And when we prayed earlier that the Lord would speak to us in ways that we could understand, I want you to know too, that's a prayer for you as well. All of us need God's help to understand who he is. And so welcome into our time of looking at the Lord's ascension to heaven. First, the power of the ascension. Let let me describe it this way. If you spent a good portion of your life savings to build a mansion, to build a mansion and it, it was your dream home, but then you never lived in it. And that dream home, that mansion, that palace sat empty. That would be a bridge to nowhere. You, why, nobody does that, right? Where they, they build it and then they don't move into it. Or, and this isn't me, but if you were a really good cook, my wife is a really good cook. My mother-in-law Oh, she could cook too, as well as my mom. I have been the benefactor of great cooks in my life. I'm just not one of them. I'm, a, I'm more of an eater than I am a cooker, and, and I'll do the dishes. So anyway, if you could cook a great meal and you, you invested money and time to cook the very best meal that you could, you'd want somebody to eat it. You'd want somebody to partake and enjoy and, and be able to maybe participate with them in the joy of that meal. But if you did all, took all that time and all the expense to make the best meal possible and no one came to eat it, that, that's just not what you would do, is it? it? A great meal deserves to have diners who enjoy it and consume it. Or let's say you're in construction and you're wanting to build a highway and you've got to go through some obstacles and you need a way to clear out those obstacles and you built the biggest bomb you could build to to blow away a section for a road, but it had no detonator, that it would be useless. The ascension of Jesus Christ is like the detonator to the rat, to the church, to the followers. It, it explodes the Lord's power into us. L- let me explain it this way. Luke captures in, in the very first chapter of Acts, this account where they're with Jesus and he's blessing them. And in some ways, it's just the same way it's always been. He died, but he was resurrected, and now he's back again with them. He shared meals with them. He's teaching them. He's helping them to understand the scriptures. And then he's gone again, and they're standing there looking into heaven. And these two angels come, and they, they say, men of Galilee, Why are you standing and staring? He's coming back. But when they were there looking and straining, it's as if they lost him again. And they didn't understand his ascension. What they understood the ascension to mean was loss again. But the angels helped them see, oh no, no, you haven't lost him. He's coming back. He's coming back, and he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. So when he describes that same account in the gospel, in his gospel account in Luke 24, it says that they went back to Jerusalem rejoicing. So when they're looking and they're straining before the, before the angels explain to him, you haven't lost him, he's coming back. Before that, it there was, they didn't understand the ascension as power, as the detonator that would ignite them into the calling that Jesus had placed on their life. It wasn't loss. It was great power. And so they returned giving God honor and glory and waiting with anticipation, waiting in Jerusalem, just like the Lord had told them. It's not loss. It's magnification, infinite magnification. But not only is the ascension 
power, but it has meaning. And the meaning is it, it signals a change of relationship. So if we understand ascension as spatial, it, let's say you were visiting in England and you could go to Buckingham Palace where maybe the throne, where the queen would sit on a throne. I, I doubt that you or I would have access to that, but I'm sure there would be steps to come up and sit down and you could maybe ascend the steps and actually sit on that throne. You could ascend, but that would be in time and space. It wouldn't mean that you were the sovereign of England. When it says that Jesus ascended to heaven, he wasn't space traveling. It wasn't that he was going somewhere in time and space. It was that he was ascending to sovereignty. He was ascending to the throne. And his relationship with you and me, with his disciples, his relationship with the universe was going to change. The ascension is about relationship and the change of relationship. It's power to you and me through the Holy Spirit, but it's also a change of relationship. Maybe you'll remember when Jesus had died and then was resurrected, there were some women that went to his tomb and it was empty. And when they saw him and recognized that it was him alive, Mary Magdalene was one of those, she clutched to him. Do you remember that scripture in John? She clutched to him. And Jesus says in the 20th chapter of John's gospel, Mary, don't hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to my father's, to to my father. I have not yet ascended. And some people take this to mean, oh, you, you can't touch him in his resurrected form. That's taboo. But we know that's not the case because He sat and ate with them. He even invited Thomas to touch him. So the fact that he was telling Mary Magdalene, don't touch me for I have not yet ascended, it doesn't mean that's taboo. I think what it means is this. Mary, you think you're going to lose me again. You don't have to hold, don't don't hold on to me like that. I've not yet ascended because when I do ascend, my relationship with the universe is going to change. And one of the things that will happen is I will be able to be with you wherever you are, as well as everyone else. Because when Jesus ascended to his throne into sovereignty, he left the bounds of time and space and took his rightful place of sovereignty in the universe. And one of the things that he could not do in mere human form, that he could in an ascended form, was to be with us no matter where we're at. He could say to Mary, if you are locked in a dungeon, if you go to the darkest place, or you go to your happy place, wherever you go from now on, I can go with you, and I can also be with all of my other followers. You know, these days of the coronavirus, they're dark, aren't they? We we almost are like moths to the flame as we watch news accounts. What's the bad news today? And we we turn it on, and it's like, we're not necessarily wanting to hear that, but we hear bad news after bad news. Here's some good news, and it, it, it's because of the ascension of Jesus. No matter how dark it is where you're at, no matter how dark these days are financially or medically, no matter how dark they are, Jesus can be present with you and with me. He would say to you and me, I think what he said to Mary Magdalene, don't hold on in this form. Don't, don't worry. You won't lose me again. You won't lose me again. I'll be with you. And so Jesus's ascension wasn't just for power to detonate us 
into the calling that he'd given to us. It was for relationship as well. And I'm wondering, maybe, maybe, maybe you could find a renewed hope in times when you're wondering, how am I going to make it financially? What if one of my loved ones dies? What if I lose my job? What would it do for you to know that Jesus Christ, the sovereign over all the universe, not just the English throne, not in America, the sovereign of the entire galaxy, the entire universe is with you and hasn't abandoned you and will not abandon you. That's, that's the, the meaning of his ascension. But there's one more, along with the power and the implication. It's, there's, there's an implication, not just power and, and relationship, but the implication is this. When Jesus' disciples were with him, and they asked him a question. They, they asked it something like this. Is now the time that you're going to reestablish the, the kingdom? I like how it says it in the New Living Translation. Are you going to reestablish our kingdom? They had been with him for three years. He talked about the kingdom of God. He'd proven to them in his teaching in many ways his was not an earthly kingdom. And then he died and was, they lost hope, but he was resurrected and they found hope in the living Jesus. And they come back to him after all of that and they say, is now the time that you're going to establish the kingdom? A Jewish, political, earthly kingdom? Is this going to be our day? Are we going to be in the majority? And Jesus, uh, maybe in my terms, he'd be like, uh, yeah, no, no, that's, that's not what we're doing. And it's not for you to know the time and the place of the establishment of the kingdom of God. It's for you to prepare. And I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. Listen, here's one of the implications of the ascension. After all the time that he'd invested into his guys, and then they ask him, so are you going to do it here and now? He could have said, uh, fellas, change of plans. Uh, clearly, you're not going to be able to cut it. I thought maybe you could, so, but you know what? I'm just going to stick around for the duration. Just keep following me. No, Jesus didn't say that. What he said was, you will be my witnesses. You are going to be my hands and feet. Jesus creates a co-op, the divine with the human. Now, if I was God, and aren't we glad I'm not, because I'd be a colossal failure out of the gate if I tried to be God. In fact, I've tried to be God in my own life in a lot of ways, and it is Absolutely, I auger into the ground every time. I would never invent a co-op between the divine and the human. I would just take care of it myself. But Jesus says, no, no, I'm not going to come and establish some sort of earthly political Jewish state. What I'm going to do is I'm going to empower you to be a witness that there is life after this life, that there is life in me. You go tell others about me and you'll see that there is a detonation, that there is power that you will have and others will have who will repent and receive me as their Lord. That's what we're going to do, fellas. Stop worrying about the time and the place. Only the Father knows that. And this is, this is interesting because it's important to study the, the prophetic books. It's important to study Revelation. In fact, the author of Revelation, John, says that there will be a blessing on those who read and understand it. But sometimes we can read in trying to discover 
about the end times, and we get so caught up into predicting the events that we find that we're not prepared for the end times that we've been trying to predict. The reality is this. You and I are living in the end times. And you're like, whoa, Sean, are you about to give a date and time when the Lord's going to return? No, I'm not. Think about it this way. You, you and I aren't going to live for a thousand years. Very, very, very few people ever live for a hundred years. How old are you? If you were to take your age now and then just calculate, I'm going to live till I'm a hundred. How much time do you have left? If you're young or you're old, it's that fast. Time is going to go that fast. The reality is you and I, are li we're living in our own end times. Now, we may not be living in the end times of the history of man. Who know? It's, I suppose it's possible. There are a few signs and indicators. But even if it's not in the end times of man, we're living in our own end times. And don't we want to live as ones who are prepared to serve the master before we're taken to his kingdom? Listen, this life is not all that there is. There is a life afterwards. That's one of the implications of the ascension. When Jesus says, I'm appointing you to be my witnesses of that. Another implication, and this, this is where it, I might step on somebody's toes. I'm stepping on my own toes with what I'm about to say. Jesus took imperfect people and co-opted with them. And he's still doing that in his church. Think about that. You and I are made of the very same stuff that the apostles were made of. And if we can look back, we can look back maybe with the Holy Spirit. No, they missed it. No, he wasn't going to establish an earthly kingdom. But we have the benefit of the Holy Spirit. They didn't, at least at the time when they asked that question. But you and I say silly things. And we do even sillier things than the things that come out of our mouth, don't we? And yet, Jesus hasn't abandoned us. And he would say to you and me what he said to his disciples, the very first ones, you will be my witnesses. I am going to detonate in you the power of my ascension through the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses. If the Lord, and here's the implication, if the Lord is that patient with us, should we not be that patient with one another? Oh, and have you found during the COVID days that your patience is wearing thin? That it's harder and harder to be patient with people? Even people, dare I say it, that you're in the same house with. And yet, one of the implications for a follower of Jesus Christ of the ascension is that he co opted with the frail and imperfect. He was patient and still gave them a purpose and a charge. You, I've chosen you to be my witnesses and I'll be with you and I'll strengthen you to do it. I wonder if in these days, one of the implications of the ascension in, and, and you might be encouraged to know, the Lord can give you strength to be patient, even in these days where it seems like it's wearing thin. We're empowered during these days. The ascension was for dark times to come. We're in a dark time. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, filled with his Holy Spirit, are ready to be detonated in a world that desperately needs light and power and hope. We might feel like we're standing just looking, oh, it's all lost in these days of the pandemic and we're just staring into the skies and the angels would come alongside us and say, 
men of Galilee or men of Grant County, women of Grant County, wherever you live, why are you staring up? The Lord's going to return. Return to Jerusalem. Receive his Holy Spirit. Be filled with power. He's going to use you as his witness. You and I were created for such a time as this by the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. Don't let anybody fool you about who you are. You are filled with the Holy Spirit if you have repented and asked Christ to take the throne of your life. If you have surrendered the sovereignty of your life to him, the one who is the true sovereign, then you know who you are? You are a spirit-filled, powerful child of God, ready to be his witness in these days. Take a moment to pray with me, would you, before we worship again. We just take this moment to say thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for having a plan that was beyond our wisdom. We surrender to you to be used by you as your witnesses. And we thank you that you've made us one of your own children, empowered us, and that you are with us. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you as you worship in this singing of this song.
just before we close, before we go out with a great song, you're going to love the next song that we sing. I want to remind you of this. You have not lost the Lord. You are not abandoned. You are an adopted child of God. You are commissioned by him to be a witness for him, and you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. I want to come back around to something I said earlier. You might be here watching this, investigating who is God. Let me tell you, the first, the, as a pastor, the best advice I could give you, I've already tried to point you toward faith in Jesus Christ. And I will tell you, the very first place that the Lord always starts with us is in the inward. It's not in the outward, what we look like, what we say, what we consume. Humans always want to take care of the outside, but God always wants to start inwardly in our heart. There is a throne in the life of every person, a little place of sovereignty in that life. Now, it's not total, complete, eternal sovereignty, infinite. It has a shelf life. Your sovereignty and my sovereignty is the shelf life is our age when we live and die. Only God has infinite and eternal sovereignty. But when any one of us chooses to surrender sovereignty to him, by faith in Jesus Christ, essentially to say, God, I'm stepping off the throne of my life. I surrender it willingly to you by faith in Jesus Christ. That person is instantly made a child of God, instantly adopted, instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. Does that mean we become instantly mature Oh, no, no, I guess I'm exhibit A on that. None of us becomes instantly mature, but we can become instantly a child of God. And I say to you and invite you today, would you make a decision of your own will to surrender that throne in your life to God through faith in Jesus Christ? I'm going to say a word of prayer. Maybe you would want to join me and make this the day that you became a child of God. Pray with me, would you please? Oh God, we just say to you again, we believe in you. Jesus, we believe who you said you were, the Messiah, the Son of God, God himself. And by an act of our faith, we surrender our life, the throne and sovereignty of our life to you. Come in and sit in that place of honor. I will follow. I will follow you and I will worship you. And Father, I pray that you would bless the people that have prayed this prayer. I pray that you would strengthen them and now begin that process of helping them to grow mature in their faith and their understanding of you. And we ask for this blessing in the name of our master, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Friends, the Lord bless you. Stay the course. Don't give up. And remember that the Lord has appointed you and me to be his witnesses. Go out there in the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that he is with you. The Lord bless you.